Assalamu alaikum, everybody. My name is Tariq Khalil, Education Coordinator with American Muslims for, for Palestine. Thank you for joining us for this very important webinar, From Grassroots to Congress, Progressives Exposing Israeli Apartheid. And we have a phenomenal uh, panel with us today to talk about this very important issue. And before we get into um, introducing, um, or excuse me, before we get into our very, very first question, I want to just briefly introduce our four panelists, and then we'll just pick it up from there. Joining us is Beth Miller, who is the political director at Jewish Voice for Peace Action, where she, where she spearheads the group's congressional advocacy and political work. She joined JVP staff after being a longtime member leader in the JVP NYC chapter. Beth formerly worked as the U.S. Advocacy Officer for Defense for Children International Palestine where she was a co-leader of the National No Way to Treat a Child campaign. We also have with us Katie Helper, who is the host of the Katie Helper Show, a live stream, YouTube show, podcast, and WAI radio show. She's the co-host of the YouTube show and podcast Useful Idiots, which she co-founded with Matt Ta Tabi at Rolling Stone and now hosts with Aaron Matei. Past guests of these shows include Bernie Sanders, Noam Chomsky, A.B. Martin, Miko Paled, Nora Erekat, Danielle Ellsberg, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and more. Her writing has appeared in The Nation, The Guardian, NY Mag, and more. We also have with us Josh Rubner, who is an adjunct lecturer at Georgetown University's program on justice and peace and is pursuing his PhD in Palestine studies at the University of Exeter. He's the author of Shattered Hopes, Obama's Failure to Broker Israeli Peace and Israel, Democracy or Apartheid State. He is a former analyst in Middle East Affairs at Congressional Research Service. And lastly, we have Eva Borgwart, who is a leader in If Not Now, a movement of young American Jews working for freedom and dignity for Palestinians and Israelis, where she's helping lead the organization's long-term strategic planning process. She's been organizing on Israel-Palestine since 2014, focusing primarily on urging the American Jewish community in Congress to advocate against home demolitions in the southern Hebron Hills. She worked in, on the 2020 election in Arizona and was a co-author of the recent letter from 500 plus campaign staff to President Biden asking him to do more to protect Palestinian rights. I wanna thank our speakers for being with us today and thank you for allowing me to shorten your bios so that we can get through this uh, this very important webinar, you know the 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 trigger for this was a statement made by Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, first Palestinian Congresswoman. Her statement was made at our at um, Americans for Justice in Palestine Advocacy Days, where she made the following statement. That we're gonna play the clip and then and we'll uh, we'll take it from there. I want you all to know that among progressives, it has become clear that you cannot claim to hold progressive values yet back Israel's apartheid government. And we will continue to push back and not accept this idea that you are progressive, except for Philistine. You know, this statement um, caused, a, caused a large backlash and an unwarranted reaction. One cannot simultaneously claim to hold progressive values and support Israel's apartheid government. So it is in that spirit that I want to just ask you all a very general question and I would like you to tackle it as best as you possibly can. What do you make of the political climate today as it relates to defending Palestinian rights and expressing an anti-Zionist point of view? We can uh, go ahead and start with Beth and we'll work our way down. Thanks so much, uh, Tarek, for <clears throat> having me on today. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm getting over COVID right now, so forgive the, <laughs> um, uh, but it's really an honor to be on this panel with all of you and to get to speak with you all and everyone watching. Um, I think that we, to start answering this question, right, about the political climate, especially in the US, uh, for Palestinian rights activists and for those of us who are anti-Zionists, we have to start first by grounding ourselves in the moment in Palestine right now. Literally, as we speak, as this webinar is happening, the Israeli military and Israeli settlers protected by the Israeli military 
are rampaging across the West Bank, including Jerusalem and East Jerusalem. They're putting refugee camps under siege. They're blocking entrances to cities across the West Bank. Palestinians are being shot and killed, including Palestinian children. Tear gas is being rained down on residential areas. The situation is uh, it's under it's on fire right now. Um, and as always, Palestinians are bearing the brunt of the brutal and violent Israeli apartheid system that we just heard Congresswoman Tlaib talking about. That's the context that all of this is taking place in. So whatever the political climate is here in the United States, it is the result of what the Israeli government is doing right now and the result of Palestinians who are organizing to try to stop the occupation and liberate themselves from this apartheid rule. So that's that has to be the context that we're operating in, right? So given that, given the fact that over the last several years in Palestine, you know, we know that for decades and decades and decades, this brutal apartheid regime has been reality for Palestinians. We've also seen the Israeli government grow increasingly bold, right? And they've learned the lesson taught to them by the United States and taught to them by the broader international community that they can do whatever they want with no accountability, right? And they will continue to get money, they will continue to get funding by the United States. And so they are doing that and they are barely hiding anything anymore. And the result has been that the world has been paying more attention and seeing more of what they either didn't want to see, actively refused to see, or couldn't see before. And so now in the US, over the course of the last several years in particular, although it's the result of decades of Palestinian-led organizing here in the United States, um, we're seeing that the progressive, the broader progressive movement is coming to understand the reality of Israeli apartheid and what it means for Palestinians in a way that was just simply not true before. And that has meant that progressives have come to understand that there's, there's no unique exception to be made for Israel or for Palestine. In the years before, there was this kind of broad idea that you could be, again, as Congresswoman Tlaib said, progressive except for Palestine, right? You had Democrats who would espouse progressive ideas on so many issues, but when it came to Israel, when it came to Palestine, all of a sudden their entire value system would shift and change. And that's just not accepted anymore. And the broader progressive movement is embracing the Palestinian rights movement and specifically embracing the anti-Zionist struggle as part of its broader agenda. And what that has meant is that the political climate for organizing here in the United States has, uh, has become much more tense in a way that I think is inevitable, right? There's that, there's that very famous old phrase that the closer you get to winning, right? First they, they laugh at you and, and first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, right? They're fighting us. That's what's happening right now. That's very clear. And there's many, many examples of it. One example is what you just mentioned. Congresswoman Tlaib says something as undeniably true, a simple fact, which is that Israel is an apartheid state. It is just proven under international law. The world's leading human rights organizations have shown it to be true time and time again. Israeli human rights organizations have said it. Palestinians have been saying it for decades. And that you can't be progressive and support apartheid. She says something as simple as that, and the entire anti-Palestinian establishment in this country explodes and is up in arms about it, right? And they go on the full offense and full attack and smear it as anti-Semitic when there is no piece of what she said that could be remotely, logically, even close to being considered anti-Semitic. And notably, they attacked her because they find her to be a threat, right? That's why they attacked. What she said was true. It resonates with an audience and anti-Palestinian groups know that. And so they attacked her for it to try to slam her down and silence her and scare people from saying similar things in the future. And that's why we saw so many of her democratic co colleagues piling on and attacking her and attacking specifically a twisting of her words, right? Like if you look at the way she was attacked, it wasn't actually about what she said. She said, you can't be progressive and support Israeli apartheid. And all of a sudden, everyone was saying that she was saying that Jews weren't allowed in progressive spaces. It's just simply not what she said. 
But the response to what she said goes to show that there is a fear, right? That there is a feeling among our opposition that they are losing ground and that they are going to try to like fight back wherever they can when it makes no logical sense even. The other thing that I think is worth mentioning and noting um, that speaks to the political climate of the moment and I think speaks to the fact that anti-Palestinian groups are quite scared right now and that they're worried that they're losing, losing, losing hold of kind of the American understanding of what's happening in Palestine is this election cycle, right? APAC, a long-standing anti-Palestinian lobby organization for the first time ever since being founded in the 1960s, has officially thrown its hat into the electoral ring. They never had a PAC before. They only existed as a, as a group that did congressional advocacy. We can talk about the nitty gritty of what was really going on, but in reality, they never had a PAC. And they didn't not have a PAC because they never thought of it, right? It's not like one day they woke up and they were like, what if we made a PAC? They made a PAC because they felt they needed one. They saw the 2022 elections coming up and they felt that there was more progressive candidates than ever before who were willing to speak out against Israeli apartheid and defend Palestinian rights. And so they were like, we need to grip harder and we need to be able to throw more money at candidates to try to stop this from continuing. And so I think that what I'll end on really about this political moment, the closest I, you know, this is a, this is a dark time right now, but I think that what we as people watching, I assume are part of this movement can take from this is that it's dark and it's hard right now because we are gaining momentum and poll after poll is showing that especially among democratic voters, there is a shift in what people want to see the U S government doing, and they want to see accountability for what the for Israeli war crimes against Palestinians. And that's why there is such there's this this increasing smackdown and crackdown that we know has been going on for decades, but is perhaps turning up even more in this moment. And so it just means that we need to also buckle down and keep organizing even harder. Thank you for ending on a positive note. There was a lot of, uh, uh, you know, um, a lot of reality that you definitely let set in in the beginning of this webinar. So thank you for that, Beth. Um, same same question, um, Katie. I would like you to tackle that same question regarding the political climate that we're in, and as it, as it relates to defending Palestinian rights and expressing an anti-Zionist point of view. Sure. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I guess I'll just share what happened to me recently because I think that answers the question to some extent. Um, I was a weekly contributor at. The, the Hills show called Rising, which is a, a web show that they have. It's a, on YouTube. And I was a guest every week. I'd appear for over the course of three years. Um, and then I started doing some guest hosting. And as a host, you get to write these things called uh, radars, which are basically monologues delivered straight to the camera. And I decided that I would write one on um, Rashida Tlaib's comments and more specifically, uh, defending her from the attacks that she was subjected to. Um, as Beth mentioned, her comments were taken totally, not just taken out of context, but uh, Jonathan Greenblatt from the ADL just lied about what she said. He made it seem like she had specified um, a, a litmus test for American Jews. She didn't mention American Jews in her comment about the realization more and more that progressives cannot be progressive and also support Israel's apartheid government. Um, so she was smeared, not surprisingly, by the usual suspects, including members of Congress, um, the ADL. Uh, Jake Tapper did a segment on it also where he did that classic, classic kind of Trump slash Fox News thing where some people are saying, so he said some of her Jewish colleagues are saying it's anti-Semitic. And so I decided that I would do a monologue about Tlaib's comments, the response that they uh, provoked, and also just laying out the case that Israel is indeed an apartheid state. Because one of the other untrue things that Jonathan Greenblatt said was that Israel does not have an apartheid state. So what I did was I um, made the case by citing international law, the United Nations, uh, and the International Criminal Court. I explained that it was a actual crime. There was a crime of apartheid. I cited and quoted Israeli law that made it clear that it fit this definition. I also cited Palestinian human rights organizations, um, international human rights organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. 
I cited and quoted B'Tselem, the Israeli human rights organization. Then I quoted several Israeli officials, including um, Israeli prime ministers, who had said that either Israel was an apartheid state or was going to become one. And then I quoted Nelson Mandela and Desmond Bishop Tutu and a um, foreign, min foreign policy minister of the South African government today, all uh, to make the case that Israel is indeed an apartheid state and how th it's, just, it's just a question of facts on the ground. It's not about your opinions or your feelings about Israel being an apartheid state. So I delivered that monologue, they filmed it, and then I learned uh, a, a producer called me and told me the higher ups at the Hill uh, were not going to run the monologue. They were not going to stream it. It wasn't going to be released on YouTube. And I spent a few days trying to get them to release it and they refused. They called me and told me that uh, they weren't going to, the editor in chief of the Hill told me they weren't going to release it. I asked why he said he'd gotten into very excuse, various excuses. Um, the producers actually told me that there was a policy a new policy that they didn't know about against uh, op-eds, either written or video form about Israel, just kind of total, total ban on those op-eds. Um, and when I pushed back and tried to see if I could at least talk about it as a guest, if they weren't going to run my segment, then uh, I was told to check my email. And that's when I saw an email from uh, an executive at the Hill and Nexstar. Nexstar just bought the Hill telling me to uh, that my services were no longer needed. They generously encouraged me to send any unpaid invoices and uh, wish me best of luck. But the uh, good thing is that uh, I was able to still make this video that The Hill censored me over and fired me over. And I think this is an important thing to look at and remember, which is that um, we have to have, even if we're trying to have our one foot in corporate media and mainstream media, that it's important to have a foot also in independent media. So I reached out to the people at Breakthrough News and we made the video anyway. So you can find the video and watch the video, which lays out why exactly Israel is an apartheid state. But I think the the response, like Beth was saying, shows a kind of despair that they have to uh, smear and distort what's been said and shut down any dissent, anything that kind of deviates from the official narrative about Israel-Palestine. And that's why they also will, of course, hide behind allegations of anti-Semitism because they'd like people to just uh, they'd like to taint the messenger so that they can taint the message. Okay, I have so many questions for you, but uh, um, I did want to uh, mention to the audience that we did put the video in, in the uh, Facebook chat. So please click on it. I believe, I believe it's a 12 minute clip. Very, very insightful. That's your, um, that's your uh, kind of quick link to apartheid 101 if you want. Um, that's what, that's what I would like to call it. Um, okay. Um, Eva, um, I know I know a lot has been said, um, but I would like you to also tackle that question. And you were also at uh, Virtual Advocacy Days. Can you tell us what you make of the political climate today, especially as it relates to defending Palestinian rights? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so grateful um, to Beth and to Katie for offering the framing and also really grateful and honored to be here. Um, and um, thanks especially to Beth for grounding us in um, what's happening in the West Bank right now, which obviously forms the context and the backdrop for all of these conversations about um, like what is and isn't acceptable to say or to speak out loud about um, in our um, American discourse. Um, and uh, and that really that's sort of obfuscating the actual reality that people are experiencing right now under siege, like effectively on fire in the West Bank. Um, and um, and as a whole, like we're seeing that, yes, the progressive movement is coming to understand more and more of that reality. Um, and that all of this backlash, again, as Beth said, is coming in the context of immense progress in many ways in public opinion. Um, uh, the strategy is basically to sort of try to pick off and isolate people one by one, um, Katie, in terms of what happened to you, um, and then these most recent comments by Rashida, like, this is not the first time that she has used the word apartheid. This is not the first time that anyone in Congress has used the word apartheid. Um, but they're trying to pursue a strategy of sort of isolating people and in instances one by one and sort of activating this like outrage machine um, uh, in order to try to make people scared to speak out. And the context behind that is that 
40% of American Jews under 40 think that Israel is an apartheid state. These are not marginal views. Um, this is something where people are seeing the reality on the ground. They're reading the reports by Palestinian human rights organizations, um, Israeli human rights organizations, major human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty, um, and they're seeing the reality for themselves. And yes, there's backlash that's coming out of fear of sort of losing control of the conversation. Um, and it's also, it's really clear, I think, with apartheid in particular, um, what organizations like APAC, um, like the American Jewish Committee, like the Democratic Majority for Israel, what they're afraid of. Um, because um, people really feel that sort of the implications of framing the reality um, in Israel-Palestine as apartheid um, are like annihilation or that it's existential. Um, and this isn't the only instance um, where that conflation happens. Um, we've seen um, with many fights where we're trying to redistribute um, rights or wealth or land from civil rights, reparations, land back, um, there's this leap that happens from equality and redistribution of wealth um, to genocide, um, to being pushed into the sea. Um, and there's this fear that sort of giving people basic rights and freedom um, means that another group of people gets effectively pushed into the ocean. Um, and that logic of us or them um, is basically what's animating um, the, the approach that APAC and um, DMFI and all these other um, groups that want unconditional US support for any anything that Israel does, including the most egregious human rights violations want. Um, and it, it means that um, to secure safety for Jews to, is to deny Palestinian safety, human rights, freedom of movement and dignity, and even to acknowledge the reality of denial of those rights, as we're seeing with the word apartheid, um, is itself undermining Jewish safety. In fact, acknowledging Palestinian people as human beings is to do so. Um, and we're seeing sort of the most extreme iteration of that strategy. Um, uh, we're seeing that obviously that creates an investment in oppression. Um, it means that um, uh, it, it creates an investment against sort of um, democracy um, and popular opinion, which again is swinging in favor of um, wanting everyone to have human rights. Um, and ultimately it results in an alignment with others who also want to undermine democracy and who also see safety as a zero sum thing where protecting one group of people has to result in the oppression of others. Um, uh, many people were shocked um, this election cycle when um, APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, endorsed 109 Republicans who voted to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Um, but actually, in many ways, it's a logical extension of um, APAC's worldview, um, where they are also invested in a worldview that is some people being safe at others' expense and aligning with people who share that. Um, and this is this is only sort of like the most recent and the most extreme strange alliance um, that's resulted um, from that project. Um, Christian Zionists um, who want most Jews to be annihilated in an end times reality um, and the US military industrial complex and weapons contractors who are profiting off of what effectively is a gift card that the US gives Israel um, $3.8 billion every year to buy our weapons. Um, and and now um, uh, these Republican members of Congress who have like large swaths of their bases who actually um, like wish violence on Jews um, and that they're forced to ignore um, the anti-Semitism um, in the allies that they have um, for this project of unconditional US support for Israel. Um, and so as progressives um, who believe in equality and human rights, um, the first thing is embracing the idea that it's not that you can secure safety for some at the expense of safety for others. And actually it's that all of our safety is tied up together um, and all of our futures are tied up together, which we embrace on any other issue, um, which is a core thing that most American Jews believe. Um, and we saw this with the attempt to destroy the political career of Andy Levin, um, who is like embracing progressive values um, in a lot of different advocacy that he does. He's been a union organizer. He works on human rights. Um, and he advocated essentially an extremely middle of the road, basic um, like policy proposal on Israel, which um, was not particularly bold. It literally was just, we should not like 
give U.S. aid to directly to Israeli human rights violations. Um, and the goal was to destroy that. And what's really interesting is that Andy is speaking out of the center of the American Jewish community. Um, so talking about this interesting shift that's happening and the hope um, that we're hoping to end um, our comments on um, is that, is that right now, um, APAC and um, folks who want the, the U.S.-Israel relationship to send aid to Israel at all costs are turning against sort of increasingly the center of gravity of the American Jewish community. Um, and it's up to progressives to lead the way, to show that our safety is tied together, um, um, to call out um, uh, like a Palestine exception to our progressive values um, and also to call out the type of things that happened like with Kanye West and Tucker Carlson this week. Um, what's really interesting is that the right is leaving a huge gaping hole there where the amount of vitriol that was directed after Rashida's comments about Israel's apartheid government was exponentially many times the backlash that came to um, Kanye West comments and Tucker, Tucker Carlson platforming them about like Jews literally controlling the US media. Um, and so we can also embrace that um, as progressives and demonstrate that actually we are very, very clear that we're gonna stand up for each other and all of our futures are tied together. Yeah, I couldn't watch that whole interview. I, I stopped at some point. Um, I don't. I don't know how it ended. Um, anyway, um, Josh, I know a lot. Of, a lot has been said, but you actually wrote a book, um, um, "Israel: Democracy or Apartheid State." So you have definitely the, the background to speak on this. Um, connect. Connect the dots for us, Josh. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me on this important webinar, Tarek. I really appreciate it, and. You know, really salute Katie and and feel um, very maddened and infuriated about what happened to her. And I think that that's an indication of the types of smearing and vilification and demonization of really anyone who speaks up against Israel's settler colonial policies, the racist nature of Zionism, the apartheid nature of Israel's policies. And her clip is really brilliant. You should all check it out. It's a really, really fantastic encapsulation of what Israeli apartheid is and how Israel practices apartheid. And, you know, as Beth mentioned, the political situation on the ground is also incredibly maddening and infuriating. And in addition to all of the things that Beth mentioned, ever since September 29th, I've been thinking about this seven-year-old child, Rayan Suleiman, who was literally scared to death by Israeli soldiers raiding his village. This is the level of brutality of Israel's military rule over the Palestinian people. And when you have people like Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib saying that these Israeli government parties are, ap are apartheid and indefensible for progressives to support, not only is she speaking a self-evident, obvious truth, but it's important to remember that she's also speaking from her lived experiences, from her truth. Let's not forget that it was just a few years ago that the Israeli government prevented her from traveling home to Palestine and prevented her from visiting her grandmother. And she doesn't even know if she's ever gonna be able to see her grandmother in person again because of these Israeli apartheid policies. So how dare some of these organizations and individuals smear her and demonize her and vilify her for speaking this truth? And if there's one thing that I hope that you'll take away from these remarks, it's this, that the smearing, the vilification, the demonization, this has always been a very deliberate part of the strategy of the Zionist movement and the state of Israel to target both Jewish people and non-Jewish people alike as a way to silence criticism of this settler colonial apartheid regime. It's always been like this. And while we may feel like it's intensifying, it's always been a reality. Some of the research I'm doing right now is on a figure by the name of Khalil Tota, who was really a path-breaking Palestinian American. He came to the United States in the early 20th century. He got his PhD. He went back home. He became the first indigenous principal of the Ramallah Friends School. And then he immigrated to the United States in the 1940s and headed the Institute of Arab American Affairs, 
which was the preeminent Arab American advocacy organization in the time. And when you look at his memoirs and the memoirs of his wife, Eva Marshall, they talk about this same exact strategy playing out, that every time he spoke out, he was smeared and demonized and vilified that at every single public speaking event that he did, he was subjected to systematic heckling by people trying to silence him. And even letter bombs were sent in the mail to try to kill him. So this is not new. This is a longstanding deliberate strategy that Israel and its supporters employ to try to silence dissent and silence criticism. Now, I want to say one word about this hypocrisy of Zionist organizations and these false charges that they level. Because if you look at the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, it is claimed, and I think 100% accurately, I want to state that very clearly, 100% accurately, that to ascribe to Jews collectively anywhere in the world responsibility for the actions of the state of Israel is anti-Semitic. I agree 100% full stop. We as Jewish people living in the United States don't pay taxes to the state of Israel. We don't vote in the Israeli elections. It's not our government, okay? This is why Palestinians and allies in the Palestine Solidarity Movement have always insisted on a very clear differentiation that anti-Zionism is a critique of a political movement and ideology that can and should be leveled, and that anti-Jewish hatred is always fundamentally racist and must be avoided and distanced at all costs. And this is why we've seen actual anti-Semites distanced and removed from the Palestine Solidarity Movement over the years. But look at what happens. Look at what happens when people say, yes, we're going to differentiate between Zionism and Jewish people, as did the nine student groups at Berkeley Law School recently. They passed bylaws saying that we will not invite to our events pro-Israel speakers, those who support Zionism or the apartheid policies of the government of Israel. This is a political declaration. And the thing to remember about the First Amendment is that it's not only freedom of speech, it's also freedom of association. We have the right to choose who we want to associate with and not associate with. This is a constitutional guarantee. And look what happens when these student groups make this principal decision on a political nature. Then suddenly these same organizations that demand that you don't conflate rightly Israel and the action of Jewish people turn around and say, this political definition makes Jews unsafe. This political definition that you've adopted excludes Jewish people from campus. When it does nothing of the sort, you don't have to be Jewish as Joe Biden recently said, to be a Zionist. And in fact, most people who say they're Zionists in this country today are Christian, not Jewish. It's even gone so far in, in, in just ridiculous, risable nature that you have a former Trump administration official, Kenneth Marcus, saying that this constitutes uh, the establishment of Jew-free zones. What? No one said that. No one said Jews are excluded from any space at the University of California, Berkeley. So look, which one is it? Because you can't have it both ways. You can't say, don't conflate Jews and Israel, and then turn around and demand that same conflation when it's convenient to you. Now, of course, we understand that this is not coherent. This is not meant to be logical. This is just meant to silence and suppress criticism of the state of Israel and its policies. This was taken to the height of ridiculousness, even more so than Ken Marcus, by Congressman Richie Torres at a recent hearing of the Homeland Security Committee, where he talked about Jews feeling unsafe and so on and so forth as a result of these actions by these student groups. First of all, 
Congressman Torres, do you really have nothing better to do than to pry into the bylaws of student organizations on a campus 3,000 miles from your district? And how dare you, Congressman, try to juice-plain for us what constitutes safety for Jewish people? What makes me feel unsafe is Zionism. This is what makes me feel unsafe because Zionism is a racist ideology and all racist ideologies make me feel unsafe just as does anti-Semitism. So don't tell me, Congressman Torres, what makes me unsafe or not. And I'll stop here by saying if we do two things, we will keep ourselves on the right track. If we open our eyes to the reality that this is a deliberate, concerted, long-term strategy on the part of organizations. And if we maintain our firm differentiation between opposition to Zionism as a political movement and the policies of the state of Israel, combined with an absolute prohibition on any manifestation of anti-Jewish hatred, we will continue to build together. And we're gonna to continue to build together and we're going to win. If I could just pick up on something that, first of all, thank you to everyone who's watching now. And also to thank you again for putting this together, Tarek. And also um, thank you to all the other people on this panel. But something that Josh just said that I think is so key is that the conflation of Jewishness with Zionism is something that is so pernicious and has a long history of being an anti-Semitic trope. I mean, we know that anti-Semites like to use the word Zionist to refer to Jews. And it's pretty disturbing that basically APAC and the ADL are laundering trafficking in that same trope. So that the, the implication is that one, Jews are a monolith with no diversity of opinion. And two, that they all are supportive of Israel. And it's really dangerous to put that out there. But again, um, the ADL and the APAC and APAC are not about actually keeping Jews safe as they constantly claim to be. They're about uh, a certain political agenda. And I really appreciate what Josh, what everyone said, but also Josh, what he said about what makes us feel unsafe. And that's constantly weaponized. Um, and if if your safety requires the oppression of someone else, then you have to take a look at what your criteria are. No, thank you, uh, thank you so much. And just a, just a quick word on uh, if you if you have not, uh, please look at the chat. Um, we did post um, Katie's uh, twelve minute video, and she did cite all of the relevant resources, um, the most esteemed international human rights organizations, especially Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. And you know something just just to pick up on. Um, uh, something just to pick up on, then I'll let uh, Beth uh, comment uh, comment on this, is that when Amnesty International came out with its 300-something uh, page report, very, very detailed report, and with so much data and analysis and, and evidence and proof of what is actually happening on the ground. And then for, for a mainstream, the most esteemed international human rights organization to be labeled with that same label that Josh was just talking about, to be labeled as anti-Semitic, Amnesty International, anti-Semitic. I'm just, uh, how low can you go? I mean, you, you, you're willing to go that far to label a mainstream international human rights organization as that. So I just found that astonishing. And I feel like the the, the stronger we grow, as Josh has suggested, I feel like the, the backlash is even fiercer. So uh, Beth, um, I know you wanted to comment on System, um, systematic censorship, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. And really appreciate everything that everyone has said so far. Um, and I just, one, one thought that came to mind while Josh, you were speaking about this kind of long, decades long coordinated effort to attack, delegitimize, silence, censor, that I also wanna name another reality that is true right now in Palestine that ties into this and that aids those efforts, which is the state censorship and silencing of Palestinian human rights defenders in Palestine, right? 
So like here in the US, we see it play out. In Palestine, we see it play out. But if we just look at the last several months alone, since over the course of the last, since May, the Israeli military has shot and killed a leading Palestinian American journalist while she tried to report on a violent raid that they were carrying out in Janine. And there has been zero accountability for that. None, nothing. And the US, the Biden administration has done nothing in response. Just a couple months later, the Israeli government in the middle of the night raided seven of the leading Palestinian human rights organizations offices, ransacked their buildings, stole client files in some cases and welded their doors shut and left a notice on their door saying that you are shut down and claiming them to be terrorist organizations, which is part of a campaign that has been going on for years and that they first declared last year. And again, after they declared it last year and all of us raised, raised alarm bells, including human rights, international human rights organizations, again, zero accountability, nothing. So just to name that also part of this is like, again, when we look at what's happening in Palestine right now, as you, you, you may be watching this and thinking like, oh, I didn't realize this was happening or I wasn't sure because no one's covering it, right? It's very hard to cover and it's very hard to follow. And that's not by accident. It's not because no one's trying to cover it. It's because the Israeli military kills, injures, targets the journalists that are trying to cover it and shuts down the human rights organizations that are trying to document it. It's systematic and it's intentional. And then when there's a gaping hole of coverage on these things and it's harder to cover, it makes it easier for them to turn around and delegitimize and attack anyone who is trying to lift it up and say what's happening. And just wanted to name that, that the urgency of that as well, that this really is, it's one of those things where for those of us who are working on this and for Palestinians who are living it, just the stepping back sometimes and thinking, how is this not the most obvious thing in the world that this government is actively taking away journalists, silencing human rights defenders, and then attacking Palestinians in their homes, in the streets, in their businesses, and then turning around and doing the same to activists here. If this were any other country in the world, the response here in the US would be radically different than what we have seen. And, and, and uh, thank you, thank you all for that so much. I mean, I, I have so many notes here. I don't wanna, I don't wanna make this all about my particular questions. I can always just talk to you guys independently to ask my particular questions. But I didn't want, I didn't want to focus on something here. And I know some of you mentioned polls and the shifts in uh, polls. And what, what really, what really struck me is the existing age gap. And when you look at the polling now. You know, I think I believe the age group 29 and between 29 and like mid 30s um, or late 30s, there is this growing gap amongst that group toward sympathizing more with Palestinians and less with and less with Israel. And I found that I, I found that very interesting. And I just want to read this to you. So um, and especially within the partisan divide um, from 2002 to 2014. Democrats were significantly more likely to side with Israelis than with Palestinians. But since 2014, that preference has gradually faded. And now Democrats generally are about equally likely to, likely to sympathize with Palestinians as with, as with Israelis. And liberal Democrats have fully crossed the threshold and as of 2021, sympathize more with Palestinians. Can you, if you can just comment on just this last maybe few years in the shift in public opinion. I, I believe, and I just want to mention something um, from, from my end. When I was watching the elections, not the prior ones, the, the primaries with uh, Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, and I really saw for the first time a great divide in, the, in a Democratic primary. I mean, Hillary Clinton sounded like a right-wing hawk compared to what Bernie Sanders was saying. And, and all Bernie was saying was that we need to acknowledge Palestinians and we need to acknowledge that they're suffering. He didn't even he didn't even argue about ending the blockade. He just said they're suffering, and we have to be humane to them. That was it, and that was considered radical. But he mentioned it. A candidate for president mentioned it. So just just these last few years, do you, I mean do you, do you, do you see it the way that I do? I think the polls really suggest that. Just these last few years, you've seen this huge shift, especially among Democrats and among young people. Um, anybody can tackle that. 
whoever whoever unmutes first. I mean, I'll just say, oh, no, Beth, Beth, you go, because you're much more of an expert on this than I am. Okay, I'll just, I'll- She deferred, okay. Just, <laughs> I'll I yield my time. That, <laughs> um, I mean, let's think about 2014. What was happening in 2014, right? There was a massive assault on Gaza in which I think, thanks to social media, Folks in the U.S. saw in different ways what Palestinians had been seeing and experiencing for decades, which was the, the overwhelming brutality of the Israeli military's siege and, and assault on Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. And then what else was happening that summer, right? The shooting of Mike Brown, the uprisings in Ferguson, and a, a kind of a just watershed moment in the U.S. where Black-led anti-racist organizing here was having an entirely new moment and reshaping the progressive left in this country. And I'm, I'm sure people listening can remember that summer, the incredibly powerful moment when protesters in Ferguson were receiving tips from Palestinians in Gaza about how to handle tear gas poisoning because it was the same tear gas canisters manufactured in the US. They were being shot at Palestinians and they were being shot at black protesters in Ferguson. And I don't think we can overlook the importance of that kind of solidarity, that kind of moment, and the, the way that it shook awake so many people in the US, intergenerationally, but certainly for folks of my generation and folks of the younger generation as well. Um, and I think that that has continued to grow and the seeds that were born of the Palestinian and black organizing that was happening in Ferguson too, has just like echoed out and out and out and just, just one example of the ways that we've seen between 2014 and now, we can look at Congresswoman Cori Bush, who started, who, who was an activist in the streets in Ferguson in 2014 and began learning about the Palestinian liberation struggle from the Palestinian comrades who were with her in the street in 2014 and having those conversations in living rooms and organizing meetings at protests. And now she is a sitting member of Congress and she is casting votes and she is co-sponsoring legislation and she is taking to the House floor to speak out about Palestinian liberation. And so we can see the ways that these, these moments, these huge moments that can happen both in Palestine and in the um, organizing and social justice movements and progressive movements here in the US can connect and over the course of years radically shift the US imagination and understanding. And I think that those that's played a, a really significant role. Not only that, of course, but but I see that as when we start with 2014, certainly a, a major point. Um, Beth, I love that you I love that you brought that up um, because I like I was politicized in 2014 around this and I like came back from high school. Um, was in St. Louis, Missouri, where my parents live, was in those protests in Ferguson, was politicized by the trading tips on, on Twitter about tear gas, um, and was watching the Jewish community around me that I'd come to those protests with, who were there in solidarity um, with Black communities in St. Louis, um, there to like grieve and protest the murder of Mike Brown, um, freaking out at the Palestine solidarity messaging in the protests. Um, and, um, and that was honestly what led me to work on the Jewish community, like, and Palestine for like the next however many years is like, this is preventing us from getting involved in like domestic social justice, civil rights struggles, um, that like we as American Jews would otherwise like want to be a part of, um, like Cori Bush is my Congresswoman and like the, the ability to tell her that like, I don't know, just like our different trajectories around, um, uh, this fight, um, one thing I just wanted to say about the polling, um, and also, okay, two things. Number one, the the, um, um, the American Jewish left um, has like greatly um, expanded and proliferated um, since 2014. Um, if not now, it was founded then. Also a ton of other organizations, um, which has just um, uh, really, they've been this moral voice coming from the Jewish community um, that's been um, bold and loud um, and joining GVP and like activists that have been in this for decades um, and just emphasizing the generational shift. Um, 
I want to say something about the, f and, and then also Palestinian voices um, being more and more and more in the U.S. mainstream media and people hearing things directly from the source and not being sort of like a inter-talking heads or inter-DC wonks or inter-Jewish conversation about Palestinians, but actually hearing from Palestinians themselves. Um, and then in terms of the framing of the question, um, just toward this not zero sum thing, I really, this is sort of an invitation to pollsters, free advice for me to you, um, but just like not to fall into the right frame of the questions of like, um, sympathize with Palestinians or Israelis. It's like, should Palestinians have basic human rights? And like, is it a problem that those are being denied? Or another really popular polling question that people love to talk about is, does Israel have the right to exist? It's like, let's actually break that down. Like, did South Africa have a right to exist? Like, wh like what are we even talking about? Um, and, um, and like actually frame things in terms of like, should any state be allowed to have systemic policies that like privilege one group of people over the other um, and limit one group of people's freedom of movement? Um, and um, yeah, as progressives just really rejecting the framing of some of those questions um, and have that be one of the next radical shifts that we're able to make um, in terms of the way this conversation plays out. Yeah, how about how about this question? Do you support equality for all? <laughs> Do you, yes or no? I mean, uh, yeah, I 100% I agree. Some of these questions are really bothersome the way that the, the way that it's framed, um, especially when the distinctions become Palestinians and Israelis. Well, okay, I mean, there's also Palestinian Israelis, so it, it, that's where that's where it can get a little muddy. There is a there is a question from the audience that I that I wanna that I want to put to you guys. And that's, uh, okay, where does Palestine organizing go from here? The reality is the U.S. political establishment is either pro-Israel or pro-Israel or pro-Israel no matter what. Is there any hope for any reasonable change in policy beyond just campus events and occasional, occasional street protests? Um, Josh, you haven't spoken in a minute. Want to tackle that? Yeah, I don't know if I can speak for the entire Palestine movement. I know I can't speak for the entire Palestine movement, but you know, I think we need to get back to some basics. I think uh, a lot of us have lost sight of the Palestinian civil society call for campaigns of boycott, divestment, and sanctions to end Israeli apartheid. Uh, I think we need to renew our commitment to that and ensure the launching and successful uh, implementation of, of campaigns that move the needle on this, because this is also something very, very much feared by the defenders of Israeli apartheid. You know, we've seen many, many laws proposed uh, in, both in Congress and at the state level to penalize and yes, in some cases, even criminalize people for supporting the idea that you can boycott for Palestinian rights. Senator Ben Cardin proposed 20 years in prison, federal prison, for people who gave the UN or the EU information that would help them advance a boycott. So, you know, in addition to having these conversations, these campaigns are also very much needed. Another area that I could point to is in the electoral sphere. I think that, you know, organizations like If Not Now, organizations like JVP Action, organizations like AJP Action are definitely on the right track. And getting into the electoral arena and, you know, finding a way to back tangibly candidates who are unapologetically supportive of Palestinian rights. This is how we're going to shore up our support in Congress and how we're going to grow that support in Congress. Yeah. And um, I mean, look, the, the title of this webinar is From Grassroots to Congress. And it's really it's really refreshing to have somebody, for instance, like Rashida Tlaib, who really um, speaks the way that we speak, and she's in the halls of Congress speaking that way. So we need we need more of them. Uh, how did you feel, um, all of you, really, because you were all at the, on the at the forefront of this, at the the lack of congressional support that Rashida got um, as a result of her as a result of her comments. I mean, I. I really thought that at least some of the progressive voices would say something, and I just felt like that was uh, there was there was silence there in areas that I that I that I thought would not be silent, and obviously there was silence in in um, many parts that I assumed would be, but the but I, I felt like there would there would be a little bit of noise, and the fact that there wasn't was a little disheartening. Um, does that is that is that evidence that maybe we're uh, 
you know, we're losing a little ground or we need to, we need to pick up, pick up the pace in some, in some way. Um, um, uh, please comment on that. Eva, I see go, ahead, uh, go ahead, Katie. Oh, uh, I don't, I mean, I don't know if we're losing ground. I think that often there's a lag between public opinion and policy. And so I think that it is a shame that there wasn't more uh, speaking out around Rashida Tlaib from her colleagues. And I think that that's, we need to see more bravery on that aspect. We also need to make sure that as American Jews, we have the backs of people when they do say something that's um, in solidarity with Palestinians, that we need to make sure that people know, no, this is not an anti-Semitic thing. Stop weaponizing anti-Semitism for your own sinister political uh, objectives. So I think that's something that we also need to do is kind of make it so that this is a less um, politically costly thing to talk about. Eva, go ahead. Eva. Yeah, um, yeah, Katie, I really couldn't agree more. Um, and really, um, thank you for saying that. And um, the one thing I would say where I think we have lost a little bit of ground, and um, I think what it does is is clarify what our playbook needs to be in the future. Um, is that um, I had mentioned Andy Levin's race before. I think it really did freak out a lot of people. Um, and because like APAC and the right absolutely recognized um, the power of taking Andy Levin down um, because um, uh, he, again, he was advocating a pretty moderate position, um, but he was doing so as a former synagogue president, as someone extremely established in the Detroit Jewish community. And I think everyone in different ways had said that this same playbook has been in place for decades, is to smear anyone who talks about Palestinian rights as an anti-Semite. Andy Levin was a threat to that playbook. Um, APAC threw absolutely everything they had at him, um, and it worked. And so people are afraid of getting apac um, who might normally be a little bit bolder. Um, really agree with Katie that especially as American Jews, we want to have their back. Um, and that also, you know, and as Beth mentioned, APAC is changing their playbook um, around creating a pack, around fighting harder. Um, this is gearing up to be a, a really, really intense sort of head to head time. Um, and we've sort of watched their new strategy um, and we really kind of need to get information um, in terms of pushing back and demonstrating that um, uh, we also have a ton of grassroots power. And also, as I know Beth has highlighted, what we also saw this cycle is that unapologetic advocates for Palestinian rights um, easily won re-election. Um, so there are really, really hopeful notes as well. Um, but yeah, I think specifically in terms of, um, Katie mentioned our role as American Jews, I think that we have definitely lost some ground, um, at least temporarily, um, but we're also clear on how to get it back. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate both of you, both of those thoughts. Um, and I, I would add to that also that, you know, I think one other thing additionally that we saw from APAC this cycle is this, um, fascinating, but perhaps not surprising tactic where they would flood a race with money and not talk about Israel. Right. Right. They would run ads that were completely disconnected from the issue they work on. And then when that money successfully helped the candidate that they were supporting win, which it does because we have a broken electoral system in this country, um, then they would turn around and say this new quote that they have, I think it's their header photo on Twitter right now, which is like, supporting Israel is good policy and good politics, and that their victories are proving that. That's their line, that's their tagline. But in fact, there's no connection between those two things. They are not winning races because of Israel and their politics on Israel, and I cannot say that enough. They are winning races completely disconnected from support for the Israeli government. The candidates they are supporting are blatantly anti-Palestinian, racist, hawkish, horrible candidates. Absolutely. But they're not winning on this issue. But then once they win, they're claiming it's about this issue. So another thing that I think we all need to get better at doing is highlighting that fact and showing that disconnect and shoring up the fact that while they are running this, this kind of um flood races with money strategy we have like eva said we have people power we've actually got the majority of people behind us there was just a poll that came out that said that um an overwhelming i believe it was like 70 plus percent of u.s voters 
want a U.S. investigation into the killing of Shireen Abouakle. That's like including Republicans and Democrats, wild numbers. And so we do have the power really with us. And, and so I think that we just need to get better at naming that and bringing that and actually bringing the issue of Palestinian rights into the conversation and not letting the distraction from it happen. Absolutely. And it's uh, support for the U.S.-Israel relationship is not just good policy, it's good politics. That's the yuck. Anyway. And it becomes uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy, obviously, because they invest so much in these campaigns. They don't make it about Israel-Palestine, but they point to, like Beth was saying, they point to these victories as proof that this is a politically uh, smart thing to do. But again, that's because they're investing so much in them and helping smear their opponents without actually bringing up Israel-Palestine. Absolutely. Um, wow. I mean, um, I can't believe it's been an hour already. Um, I'll put aside the notes that I have. I'll, I'll talk to you guys in private with my with my own independent questions. I want to thank you all for uh, being here and giving us your insight. And um, thank you for your efforts and um, all of the courageous things that you all do. Please watch Katie's video. It's 12 minutes long. Um, if you don't want to read a 300-page report from Amnesty International, just watch your 12-minute video and you'll have all you need to know. Um, uh, thank you all again. I want to just remind our audience that uh, AMP's um, annual convention will be this Thanksgiving weekend, November 24th to the 26th. There's the website right there. Please get your tickets. Um, we hope to see you all there. Please bring your families and friends and wish you all the best. Thank you all again. Um, it's been It's been quite a pleasure. Thank you.